This is our second presentation for LDR 660. In week two, we're going to look at scanning, uh, visioning. Sometimes we get what we ask for. Hernan Cortez wanted a kingdom, and the only way he could really have one is if he owned an island. Perhaps not surprisingly, the explorers he commissioned discovered that Baja California was indeed an island, or at least they were willing to believe it was. The myth of California being an island persisted for almost 175 years until a group of Roman Catholic priests was commissioned to settle the controversy over whether it was an island or not. California is, of course, not an island. That comes from Dora Beale Polk, the island of California on University of Nebraska Press, 19. The history of bad business decisions makes for great storytelling. For example, Coke once had the opportunity to buy Pepsi and declined. The Yale professor who gave Federal Express founder Fred Smith a C for his paper on creating an overnight delivery service simply because he didn't think it was a feasible idea. Or in 99, Excite, if you heard of Excite recently, had the opportunity to buy Google for a million dollars and declined. And there's this example from Steve Jobs. Of course, you haven't graduated college yet, so we don't want anything to do with you. Or these examples missing the boat completely on computers and the Beatles. Why would anyone ever want to have a computer in their house? I just can't imagine. And we don't like their sound. Guitar music's on the way out. Of course, it's not just people who die for lack of vision. Organizations do, too. Digital equipment eventually got bought by Compaq, which later merged with HP, and some of the digital divisions were eventually sold to Intel. DECA split into British and American companies, merged with MCA, and currently is part of Universal Music Group, the leading producer of classical and Broadway recordings, which don't have that big of a market share. What what might they have become if they'd actually signed the Beatles? There are a number of ways to do environmental scanning, including logic models, as in this graphic from researchutilization.org. It's a fairly straightforward process of analyzing the situation, the inputs or resources available, the outputs, and the short, mid-range, and long-term outcomes or impacts, all of which works as a process regardless of product or service or the size of the organization. Logic models show presumed linkages between the inputs or resources, activities or processes, the outputs, and the outcomes. But as Bryson says, typically these linkages are not very clearly articulated. In some of your other graduate classes, you should have been exposed to value-based-management.net, which, like 12Manage, is a great resource for finding, understanding, and applying models and processes for organizational analysis, development, change, and leadership. Though, more often than not, many of these types of sites will talk about management more than leadership. 12Manage.com is where this graphic of Porter's model comes from, relating in particular to production. You've got primary activities and support activities, inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, sales and marketing, servicing, and then up in the support activities, you've got procurement, product and technology development, human resources management, and administrative and finance infrastructure, all of which leads to the value added minus the cost, gives you your profit margin. And as Bryson states, Porter's value chain is another model that may or may not provide more detail regarding the actual processes for transforming resources into outputs or outcomes than a logic model does. Just as in week one, you did a search for strategic planning models beyond Bryson, what models, processes, and tools you use within your organization or as a consultant really depends on the organizational culture and the internal and external environments that fit the needs of the organization that you're working for. If you're not aware of Drucker and haven't read any, you absolutely need to. I can't imagine graduating with an organizational leadership degree that doesn't require a study of Drucker somewhere along the line. Those are also books you keep because what Drucker has to say never becomes outdated or a passing fad. The only thing we know about the future is that it will be different. One cannot manage change. One can only be ahead of it. Management by objective works if you know the objectives. 90% of the time, you don't. The purpose of an organization is to enable common people to do uncommon things. In building a framework for strategic planning, Bryson advises you ignore the internal and external environments at your own peril. You should provide incentives for truth-telling among your team members. The future may not be wholly open, but it may become more open than we think. And we need to invite challenges to what the official future is.
A SWOT is a standard analysis that you should be familiar with. Bryson discusses in particular a variation called SWOC, where challenges has replaced the term threats, as we'll see looking at his model again next. This particular graphic comes from bizstrategies.com, another online resource for developing your toolbox of models and competencies, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Of course, looking again at Bryson's model with his 10 steps, you should clearly understand that strength and weaknesses are internal. Opportunities and threats, or challenges, as Bryson refers to them, are external. As we look at Bryson's strategy change cycle, there are both types of scans which provide input into the strategic issues the organization faces. External issues? At first glance, this may seem obvious, but that doesn't mean that those leading our organizations have paid full attention to all of them. Or, if you're missing a piece of the puzzle, you'll make decisions that aren't adequate for what's really happening in the marketplace, or you just won't be ready when either the challenge or the opportunity comes your way. Just as important is understanding the capabilities and resources that the organization has. Have we developed an organizational learning culture that allows us to gain knowledge that we're currently missing? Are we transferring knowledge and experience across departments and project teams so that past mistakes don't have to be repeated? Are we preparing the next generation of innovators and leaders within the organization and transferring the experience of older workers to their cohorts who are younger? Additionally, of course, how are we measuring performance and are we using the right measurements to get the results we need? Are we measuring the right things at all? Or are the measuring requirements taking so much time that we're inhibited from actually doing something that advances the organization? As Drucker would say, it's not making the wrong decisions that leads to failure. It's asking the wrong questions to begin with. This is a direct quote from Bryson when he teaches this class. Public and nonprofit organizations should focus on developing easily understandable and viable livelihood schemes. The schemes will build on strengths and especially distinctive competencies. Take advantage of opportunities and minimize or overcome weaknesses and threats to achieving aspirations and will be robust in the face of changing environments. And a short definition of livelihood scheme is simply a comparison of current organizational competencies to organizational objectives so that gaps and or shortcomings can be prepared for. And of course, just because we possess a competency doesn't mean we can't improve upon them because resources, knowledge, and technology continue to change. What we're looking for is an ability to be adaptable enough in our KSAs to handle any environmental threat or opportunity that comes along. Harlan Cleveland was a diplomat, author, and educator, among other things, who worked with NATO under President Johnson, was a U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, and the President of the University of Hawaii, and founding dean of the University of Minnesota's Hubert H. Humphrey Institute of Public Affairs. We tackled 20-year problems with five-year plans staffed by two-year personnel funded by one-year appropriations. Not unusual for many organizations that we currently work in. Peter Drucker, we've already discussed, says unless commitment is made, there are only promises and hopes, but no plans. Visioning should not be confused with a vision statement. We make plans and decisions based on reasonable, actionable data. But real vision or visioning goes beyond what we can see or read to the unknown. As Arthur C. Clarke stated, the only way to know the limits of the possible is to go beyond them to the impossible. Take a moment to read these two quotes as well, because even now you're working to create a future different than the one you had yesterday. That's why you're in graduate school. What's required of leadership is giving voice and image to a vision of the future that others can understand and believe in. I skate to where I think the puck will be. Those people who develop the ability to continuously acquire new and better forms of knowledge that they can apply to their work and to their lives will be the movers and shakers in our society for the indefinite future. Developing a vision sketch early in the process is particularly helpful when the organization will have trouble identifying strategic issues, directly that is. It is not possible to agree on specific detailed goals and objectives, and drastic change is likely to be necessary. A vision sketch is just a brief description, and a vision of success, according to Bryson, is a description of what the organization would look like if it succeeds in implementing all of its strategies and achieving its full potential. We talked about this in week one, but again, Howard Gardner's research in Changing Minds, published in 2006, tells us 
that whether individually or organizationally, we must have, in order to achieve change, a reason, allowing members to understand the need for change. Research provided important information that supports the reason. Resonance. The understanding of change must reach to the core beliefs of the members of the organization, the participants, to the stakeholders even. Redescriptions. The basis for change must be expressed in multiple forms, numbers, graphs, in many ways that people can understand. Shine, of course, suggests that the stories which bind members together is the most important. Resources and rewards. Members must have the tools they need to complete the change and a reward for success beyond simply keeping your job. Real-world events. Change will not be successful if it doesn't relate to real life and what's occurring outside of the organization. And resistances. Every human comes from their personal paradigms, and resistance to change is natural and inevitable, but it can be overcome, particularly if we're prepared for the resistances we're going to face. The National Institutes of Health, uh, Office of Behavior and Social Science Research, is a graphic from Bryson, visually gives us a representation of a vision that has a large strategic plan, and that can be accessed, by the way, at, uh, at the website listed here on the slide. Their strategic planning process took place every 10 years since the founding of the organization, but now is a vision and strategy that is continually improved upon. Here's a look at the website, the graphic from Bryson that gave us that representation of a strategic plan, but if you click through any of these and looked at them, it would be considerable length of documents. You need to inspire stakeholders, clearly, not stockholders, stakeholders. As a leader, whether we're talking about the entire organization or your department or team, you need to express it in multiple forms, but in clear, concise, and in ways that drive passion and excitement for your team. And so that when your team or any other stakeholder wanders off course, which is generally inevitable, you can return to the department of why and refocus efforts. A paraphrase of Peter Block from his book Community, The Structure of Belonging, is that the real change is to discover and create the means for engaging stakeholders that brings a new possibility into being. A book, by the way, published by Barrett Kohler in 2008. We inspire stakeholders clearly, focus on a better future, encourage hopes and dreams, appeal to common values, state positive outcomes, emphasize strength of unified people, use words, pictures, images, and metaphors, shine again, and communicate enthusiasm and kindle excitement among the stakeholders. Clearly communicated visions increase job satisfaction, commitment, loyalty, esprit de corps. Research shows that this is true. The basis of this slide again comes from Bryson's own presentation for his classes, so I haven't got a list of published studies that back that up, but they're not hard to find if you really wanted to invest the time. As Shine clearly states, all group learning ultimately reflects someone's original beliefs and values, their sense of what ought to be as distinct from what it is. Edgar Schein, Organizational Culture and Leadership, Josie Bass, published in San Francisco, California. The clarity about organizational values, the pride in the organization, productivity increases, and organizational effectiveness increases if we all are on the same page with what our vision and our values are. Shared organizational values in part define an organizational culture. That's, of course, not the full definition of organizational culture. Consider J.C. Quick's 1992 article from Organizational Dynamics about Southwest Airlines, though. Cultural values become the platform for specific and concrete actions designed to meet difficulty and challenge. We cannot think of organizational culture as a substitute for responsible, problem-solving behavior on the part of leadership. Culture becomes the vehicle through which problems and challenges become addressed, defined, reframed, and ultimately solved. When cultural values do not work in this fashion, they must be modified or jettisoned. The culture is not the end or the goal, but rather the means. Shared organizational values foster strong feelings of personal effectiveness, promote high levels of organizational loyalty, facilitate consensus about key organizational goals and stakeholders, encourage ethical behavior, promote strong norms about working hard and caring, and reduce the levels of job stress and tension. To suggest that the future is all butterflies, blue skies, roses, and chocolate is unrealistic, to say the least. To suggest that we as leaders can provide guidance and create an image of the future which others will want to participate in is why you're in grad school to begin with. 
but having a vision and being able to apply goals, strategies, objectives, action plans, or tactics will be part of our studies over the next several weeks. You must give birth to your images. They are the future waiting to be born. The visionary is the only realist, and a leader's role is to raise people's aspirations for what they can become and to release their energies so that they will try to get there. Margaret Mead said, and it's a famous quote you've probably seen many places, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. From Peter Drucker again, teamwork is neither good nor desirable. It is a fact. Wherever people work together or play together, they do so as a team. Which team to use for what purpose is a crucial, difficult, and risky decision that is even harder to unmake. Managements have yet to learn how to make it. The team, whether in your department or the entire organization, will become thoughtful and committed, even passionate, when you unite them behind a clear mission, vision, and values of the organization. And of course, whether leadership behaves in ways that also fulfill and don't violate those core precepts. Change is inevitable. Change that is empowering, planned, measured, and clearly anticipated creates a viable future.